All right, so uh, maybe we'll get started in the interest of uh, time. Uh, for all the you that have just joined, uh, if you could look in the chat box and uh, sign in uh, electronically uh, with the link. And then at the end of the talk, if you could uh, fill out the evaluation form, uh, I'd be greatly appreciated. So um, so thank you, everybody, for joining uh, the Medicine Grand Rounds today. Uh, it's Oncology's Week uh, to present. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Dr. Paul Al. I'm the medical lead of the uh, Division of Hematology and Oncology at Scarborough Health Network. And I have the uh, distinct and great pleasure today uh, to welcome a nationally renowned uh, medical oncologist from the Tom Baker Cancer Center um, at the University of Calgary, uh, Dr. Jan Willem Henning. Um, so Dr. Henning has been uh, practicing as a medical oncologist since 2012 uh, in breast and sarcoma malignancies. Um, he has research in, uh, interests, including health services and patient outcomes research, and is the immediate past program director of the Medical Oncology Residency Program at the Tom Baker Cancer Center, and currently holds the vice chair position of the Royal College and Medical Oncology Subspecialty Committee. Uh, he's also the medical lead of the Southern Alberta Adolescent and Young Adult AYA Program and co-chairs the Systemic Treatment Council for the uh, Tom Baker Cancer Center. Um, so thank you, Dr. Henning, for uh, joining our rounds today, um, and uh, we really look forward to your talk. Thank you very much uh, for the kind words, Dr. Lau, and uh, also the invitation to be presenting. Can I just get a thumbs up that my audio is good for anybody visually or kind of? There we go. Thank you. Um, so indeed, you know, the invitation is to come and speak with you with regards to pulmonary toxicities associated with uh, some of the new novel breast cancer therapy. So uh, my focus, as you've heard, is mostly breast cancer and sarcoma malignancies. Um, and it's particularly due to the advance in breast oncology that a new agent has been adopted as standard of care and will continue to expand the, uh, the spectrum of breast cancer and other malignancies. And some of these toxicities needs to be addressed, uh, addressed and we need to talk about it. So again, thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, these are my disclosures in terms of my activities uh, for industry. I do want to um, just emphasize that we were very fortunate to be able to bring uh, many clinical trials, but including the Destiny Breast clinical trial to Calgary. Many other places across Canada are actually now also facilitating Destiny Breast clinical trials. And you'll see why Destiny Breast is of relevance in this discussion. And then uh, the slides, as you see here, are my slides co-developed and sponsored by AstraZeneca as an educational program. Um, and I also thank my, my colleagues, uh, Javier Cortez, um, uh, Sarah Hurwitz, and um, uh, Shauna Modi, who provided slides for us. So the objectives for, for this afternoon's discussion is review novel therapy, and particularly an agent called trastuzumab durexican, which is an antibody drug conjugate. And if you talk about breast cancer, it now is expanding the, the indication in two disease subtypes, uh, HER2 positive breast cancer, as well as what we call HER2 low breast cancer. And I'll review just some of the efficacy results with you to give you a context why this is so relevant to ultimately talk in a bit more detail about toxicities and particularly an adverse event of special interest we called ILD or pneumonitis, drug-induced ILD or pneumonitis. We'll talk about some of the risk factors we've seen in clinical trials that's been published, what I encounter on, on a day-to-day -day basis in clinic. Uh, we'll talk about how to diagnose these patients with the suspected toxicity and how to manage them and manage them well. So just as a background, uh, breast cancer, as everybody knows here, is a very prevalent disease. One quarter of all breast can all cancer diagnosis will be breast cancer. Obviously, the majority of women and a very small percentage of men. We know that the lifetime risk of developing breast cancer for any Canadian woman is about 12%. Uh, so one out of nine women will develop breast cancer. And so these statistics are staggering. And I emphasize these numbers, as you can see, they're listed almost 29,000 Canadian women be diagnosed with breast cancer. So it's very prevalent. 
Uh, and and we see a lot of recurrences still, even despite advances in the in the early setting. About a third of women may develop a recurrence after treatment, optimal treatment in the adjuvant setting. So we have staggering high numbers. And as such, many of these women will engage in therapeutic programs, both early but also late stage. We still define breast cancer according to molecular subtypes, uh, both as prognostic, but also as therapeutic groups. And as listed there, almost more than two thirds are the typically hormonally receptor driven breast cancer we call luminal A. They can be lower grade, you know, slower in, in progression, best prognosis, um, and they are exquisitely sensitive to infant therapy. Then we have the luminal Bs, that's called triple positive with both hormone receptor as well as the host receptor positivity, typically higher grade. And fortunately, you'll see in the next slide that it actually carries now the best prognosis providing patients undergo treatment. We have HER2 overexpressed, also high grade, and then lastly, triple negative breast cancer. And just kind of an outline, the percentages on these cases for your reference. So recently, we've seen the triple positive breast cancer really indeed becoming our best prognostic disease because we have so many therapies. And today I'll introduce to you, to you who's new to this, but to the old timers, medical oncologists reminded of the new therapy, TDXD. And it's really treatments like this that has changed the landscape and the prognosis for these patients. Still lacking far behind is triple negative breast cancer with the worst prognosis. But fortunately, there are new things on the horizon there too with respect to immunotherapies, um, with respect to other antibody drug conjugates such as saxituzumab, covid tcan but even the agent today is touching a part of that population as well. So let's remind ourselves again, the HER2 receptor and pathway, um, always responsible for cell proliferation, motility, spread, invasiveness, metastases, and in the HER2 overexpressed breast cancer, that pathway is constituently activated. Having said that, no, it is a spectrum of positivity and, and how positive is positive, but more importantly, how negative is negative for her two presence. And we'll look a little bit at that today um, where we're at. So how do, de how do we define it currently according to the ASCO CAP guidelines for testing? So we first start off with immunohistochemistry staining and it will be classified as IHC zero with absolutely almost zero staining, less than 10%. IHC one plus, and if IHC two plus, then you commit for further testing for gene amplification, which would be then either positive or negative. And so you have this large group qualified or defined as HER2 negative, and then the smaller group, about 15, between 15 to 20% of patients being uh, tested as HER2 positive. So this has been done now for several years. This current paradigm on your left with the binary classification of HER2 positive and then HER2 negative, triple negative at the very bottom, uh, both hormone receptor, hormone receptor negative and HER2 negative. But there is now a future paradigm and we are still working on the definitions and nomenclature, et cetera, but there's a larger population of what we define now as HER2 low. And then we previously, uh, the IHG is zero, you know, that actually may be HER2 ultra low or absolutely no. So again, a new future paradigm. Really to bring us to this agent called castuzumab can, which is an antibody drug conjugates. And for the non-medical oncologists in the audience, we are now looking at delivering chemotherapy in a very different manner. These treatments are still intravenous, but instead of giving boluses of boluses of boluses, intravenous cytotoxic therapy, we deliver the cytotoxic agent, so-called the payload, by means of a delivery vehicle. And the delivery vehicle is typically a monoclonal antibody with a target. And the payload is attached to this monoclonal antibody by means of a linker. Now, 
the first thing to realize here, not all ADCs or antibody drug conjugates are the same. They are very different because they are different in the monoclonal antibody, the target. They may have different linkers and link, uh, linking uh, scientific backgrounds, and then the payload might be different as well. So ultimately, you get this ADC moving towards the target, undergoing endocytosis. The cleavable linker binds to cathapsin lysosome, which is um, highly selective in breast cancer. You'd gain an optimal release of your payload, which causes a cell DNA effect within the cell. But in TDXD, your payload, the Rex can is cell membrane permeable. So we get a diffusion out into the interstitium and surrounding cells, which can cause a cell death. Uh, and as a bystander effect. So, which is nice because not all uh, breast cancer cells may express HER2 target. And so they might be a bystander effect. The plasma half-life of the payload uh, is also uh, very short. So we see fewer systemic side effects. Now, just to say that in HER2 low breast cancer, so non-positive, um, other monoclonal antibodies and therapies have been tested. Trastuzumab, pertuzumab, and even in the adjuvant setting through the NSABP B47 trial, you know, these agents unfortunately have not demonstrated any effect or efficacy. However, recent advances in phase three studies and the publications on the left on Destiny Breast 03 and on the right Destiny Breast 04 really has changed the landscape with this agent being highly effective um, in HER2 positive breast cancer to your left, and then also impressively effective in HER2 low breast cancer, which really has changed practice for us. So if we then say there is now a new group called HER2 low breast cancer populations, we have to understand that this will affect many more breast cancer patients, metastatic breast cancer patients. So not only HER2 positive, but HER2 lows with an increase of, of the 55% added plus your 15% HER2 positive. I'm trying to say if we adopt this therapy and if we start using it in practice, we will affect many lives with a highly effective therapy. And to bring this back to our talk, you just need to prescribe this agent long enough and you will encounter some of the toxicities you need to be aware of. And very briefly, in the HER2 part of breast cancer domain, Dr. Javier Cortez, the national lead for the Destiny Breast 03 clinical trial, really tested in a head-to-head -head fashion trastuzumab can versus the index molecule of ADCs trastuzumab in Tanzine. This was a phase, phase three one-to-one -one randomizations for patients who has progressed uh, on prior trastuzumab and a taxane in the advanced or metastatic setting. Um, and again, uh, endpoints are listed on the right for you. Very important to note here, in this context of Destiny Breast 03, patients received prior pertuzumab up to 60% on both arms. And that's important for us from an efficacy perspective because many of our patients currently in practice would have had pertuzumab as the first line setting. And we wonder why TDM1 is maybe not performing as well in the real world post pertuzumab. Um, and, and perhaps it is because of the resistance uh, that may develop. So very reassuringly to see a 60% population did receive prior pertuzumab. It was mostly done as a second line study, as you can see there. Um, Sarah Hurwitz presented this last year at San Antonio, the update on the overall survival, which is positive. As you can tell, they're a very impressive uh, advantage with TDXD. And the follow-up on the progression-free survival, again, in breast oncology, we don't see a hazard ratio of 0.33. Um, this was definitely a first, and the benefit continues to demonstrate uh, on this aspect as well. Uh, the, the waterfall plot is equally impressive, but I want to draw your attention to what says complete remission. Look at the TDXD, 21.1%. So that is a bit mind-boggling for a medical oncologist treating solid malignancies. For the first time now, 
I can start treating patients with HER2 positive stage four disease. And there's a one out of five chance that this woman will sustain a complete response, a complete remission. No doubt, this has really been thought provoking, practice changing, and a lot of discussion amongst us who've used this agent kind of in lead clinical trials, but can see the translation in real life in front of us. That brings a question. So what do we do with them? Are they to stay on TDXD? How long should they stay on TDXD? Because we're talking about two years, three, four years. And this is not entirely new for us in oncology because when we first saw this with trastuzumab, about one to 2% of patients in a metastatic setting developed this complete remission. And we asked ourselves, how long to continue with trastuzumab? The same on the Cleopatra regimen with pertuzumab and trastuzumab, about 4% of patients sustained a long remission here. And look at this very significant number now on TDXD. So the response is about to, is, is definitely about to happen, but complete response is one out of five of patients. This is my only slide on toxicities and a few things I want to emphasize to you. The toxicities between TDXD and TDM1 are certainly fairly comparable, but there are a few differences. TDM1, we all know, is really a five-minute visit. Patients do well, they tolerate well. With TDXD, that can also be the case, but you have to be aware of nausea and vomiting, and you have to treat that upfront. Remember with DBO3, we left anti-emetic therapy to to physicians' choice to treat. It was not mandated. It was only after DBO3 and DBO4 that we realized as, as PIs, no, 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 this needs to be part of the protocol. And now in real world, we definitely advise triple therapy, antimedic therapy upfront. And then you can de-escalate as patients do better. You have to caution patients about fatigue and alopecia. Uh, We've all got a custom again with TDM1 being so easy to do. TDXD is a little bit different and you have to gauge your own and your patient expectations. But the question, what about the drug-related ILD or pneumonitis? Initially with the first presentation of DBO3, um, all ILD was reported at 10.5%, and it did go up to 15.2% on this interim analysis, second interim analysis. There were no deaths. We saw more grade one and grade two diagnoses, and it looks like it settled down around 15%, as I mentioned. So really, to summarize this, uh, I was able to present this on Oncology Education Forum, that really the landscape of HER2 positive breast cancer, TDXD, now took in the second line position or as trial uh, design and product monograph, if you have an early relapse after adjuvant treatment within six months, you would go directly to TDXD and skip your Cleopatra regimen. And then in the third line, there are still many agents to choose. I'm not going to go into the discussion today necessarily about sequencing, um, that is for another day and another topic, and I'll be happy to address that. But what about HER2 low breast cancer? So again, I'll remind you, we have this binary classification, um, HER2 positive, HER2 negative. And if you treat these patients, both hormone receptor positive and hormone receptor negative, after they lose endocrine sensitivity for therapies, you're left really with a kitchen sink list choices of chemotherapy. And although we have some data that maybe Rublin is the better choice according to the EMBRACE study after ataxin and anthracycline, or you know, are we still com comfortable, convenient on Cape cytobine, or should we use gem cytobine? What about venerelvin, or where does paclitaxel come back again? We have lots of options, but we really don't know which is the best one. And scarily, you know, most patients will only achieve a median progression free survival of about four months, and we start rotating through these agents. And the same with HR negative breast cancer. Once you've used your IO therapy and, and, and maybe you access to a PARP inhibitor, then what? What chemotherapy are you going to revolve? And again, with a short median progression free survival. And this was really the impetus to look at this new target, HER2 low 
and to the design of the Destiny Breast 04 clinical trial, which Shana Modi presented last year as ASCO. So TDXD was really in the fourth line position here. So meaning um, all endocrine therapy options have been depleted or refractory. So two, maybe even three, and all patients had one line of chemotherapy. And then they were randomized between TDXD and treatment of physician choice. And those choices are very typical Canadian choices. I want to emphasize the fact that the median number of lines of therapy had been three, that uh, patients had at least one line, some had two lines of chemotherapy. Um, endocrine therapy, many lines, but at least two as a median. 70% had should have had CDK4-6 inhibition, and there was a good distribution between IHG1+, and IHG 2 plus ish negative. Astounding results. These results actually um, um, resulted in a standing ovation after Shana completed her presentation. So benefit in both progression-free survival um, for, for the HR positive, as well as overall survival for HR positive and all patients. I just want to underline the fact here, if you conduct clinical trials and if you've ever participated in clinical trials for these patients who have heavily been pre-treated, it is very hard to demonstrate not only a PFS, but also to demonstrate an overall survival, thus robust. So adding a median of more than six months is very significant in terms of efficacy. The study group did look at an exploratory analysis of overall survival in the HR negative group alone, they were only 11% of the patient population, um, 64 patients, and uh, again, a benefit was seen. So what about toxicities? And again, this is now TDXD versus chemotherapy treatment physician choice. Once again, fairly comparable, but if we see discontinuations on TDXD, you'll see that ILD again, uh, coming to, to the forefront. We see actually far fewer neutropenic and febrile neutropenic event, events with TDXD versus on the typical chemotherapies. From that perspective, uh, it looks like we're doing well, um, but quite comparable from a day-to-day -day basis. What about ILD? In DBO4, unfortunately, there had been three deaths. Uh, but as you can see there, um, ILD is something that you have to be aware of with a total incidence of just over 12%. Remember, TDXD does carry the monoclonal antibody trastuzumab backbone. Whenever you hear that, you have to be concerned with cardiac toxicities. And fortunately, there were no escalated events here. Very, very small, num very small risk here. Uh, and what I typically would do in practice is I'll just make sure to start with a baseline echocardiography and then follow clinically. Some other oncologists like Javier Cortez, he would very, very ju judiciously do echoes every three months. I think in the Canadian context with a bit of uh, issues, access to resources, you know, to do a baseline and then clinical follow-up is completely appropriate. This presentation, as I said, received a standing ovation, but it was also, and it is practice changing. Uh, and not only because we have a very effective agent, but also we have a new target population called HER2 low metastatic breast cancer. The majority involves patients with HR, so hormone receptor positivity and HER2 low, but there's also a subset of triple negative breast cancer patients where the HER2 is reported as low. So not only a new target, but also a highly effective therapy. Uh, this has received uh, FDA as well as Health Canada approval. So let's jump into this drug-induced ILD, um, particularly as it relates to TDXD. So just the context, and I'm knowing that you guys know uh, pneumonitis and ILD much better than I do. Um, but as a refresher, we know that this, this condition is really marked as the presence of inflammation and scarring in the lung interstitium. And, and drugs like TDXD is only one little piece of etiology. There might be many other reasons why this happened. And even idiopathic, uh, it might occur. So again, 
the term ILD pneumonitis is a spectrum of, of lung inflammatory disorders. Now, because we saw what happened in clinical trials, and we know that this drug needs to be adopted and will be adopted as standard of care, and we know that the US have lots of experience, and they are head up with the clinical trials as well as clinical practice. Similarly to Europe, they have lots of trial experience there. You know, we as Canadians need to know where we're going, what are we doing, and how to apply all of this evidence to a Canadian perspective. So we put together an ILD, a steering committee for TDXD here in Canada. Um, and so we are reviewing all of the evidence. Uh, we are reviewing all of the resources throughout Canada, and we have come up with recommendations, which I'll share with you today. So firstly, I mentioned also the causes of ILD, idiopathic genetic autoimmune, and then exposures. But in oncology, ILD pneumonitis has become increasingly more uh, noticeable and, and prevalent. So as you can see, we've listed all the different agents. Um, it's important to note that trastuzumab, the Rexdecan, has an average uh, prevalence of about 15.4% more in breast cancer. This agent is now being tested and adopted in other malignancies such as lung, uh, such as gastric, as well as colorectal cancers, but it's more prevalent in breast cancer use. The closest competitor, if you will, if you do cross file comparisons and, and evidence, is nivolumab at 7.2%. And we know with these checkpoint inhibitors how astutely aware we are of pneumonitis and we know what to do. TDXD is double as high. Um, so we have to be ready to, to diagnose this. We have to be ready to manage this and we have to do it properly. So again, if this agent carries such a high risk of ILD, is it worth it? And I can tell you, here's the evidence. And not only here's the evidence, is this worth this? This is a highly efficacious molecule. I, I've conducted the clinical trials, still perform other clinical trials with TDXD I've used in practice, many colleagues here, maybe yourself, and it's, it's really astounding to see the results of efficacy uh, with TDXD. So is it worth it? Absolutely. Is the indication? Absolutely. But we have to be sensible, sensible as well in adopting this therapy. So here's kind of just a list of destiny trials, not only breast, but gastric, lung, others, also listing uh, the incidence of ILD. So on average, between 10 to 15% is an accurate number to reflect. Dr. Powell, um, a couple of years ago, published a paper for us and, and presented you know, what we can now see as potential risk factors for developing TDXD-related ILD. And he did a pooled analysis uh, from the early phase TDXD clinical trials, breast, lung, and others, and the pooled analysis demonstrated a few things. If you have a patient with a baseline SpO2 of, of less than 95%, and that's really a reflective of um, pulmonary comorbidities, such as severe COPD, asthma, et cetera, you have to be careful. And that's a potential risk factor. But also very interesting, and the Europeans have shown this again, that if you have a patient on drug, and typically had an SPOT of 90, 96% and then suddenly dropped more than 4% to 92, 91, or 90, a little alarm bell should go off in your head and say something is up there. Patient may still be asymptomatic, but why is that SPO2 dropping? We know the dose matters. So the more you give drug, and unfortunately, we're not using greater than 6.4. Our dosage for TDXD is 5.4. I talk about baseline lung comorbidities. Um, if it's greater than four years since initial diagnose, disease diagnosis, now that probably speaks to breast cancer where the patient had adjuvant, new adjuvant therapies, relapses, and went through multiple lines of therapy. And this is more so in the HER2 positive domain in these phase one trials. The patient had been sensitized to, to radiation therapy and multiple agents, which may have inflicted some inform, inflammation to the lung. If then getting exposed to TDXD, they may develop um, ILD more likely. Renal dysfunction on the multivariate uh, pool analysis definitely show to be a risk. 
age greater than 65 years. And it appears that initially the treatment in the Asian population in Japan was also a risk factor, although Dr. Cortes and DBO3 showed that that really didn't make much of a difference. So when does this happen? Um, the median onset of ILD for TDXD is around five and a half, four and a half to five and a half months. And then around 12 months, it seems to plateau um, and it stays kind of at the plateau, but it can still occur. Now, I'll take you back to my comment on DBO3 with a complete remission of 21.1%. Do you see how we'll treat patients in year one, year two, year three? And some patients may only develop ILD in year three. So never stop asking, never stop screening, never stop looking for ILD is the, the message. Having said that though, again, the majority of cases will be um, in the first year of treatment. Okay, so here's a few practical things we may suggest to you in the Canadian context. When you have a patient eligible for this therapy coming into clinic, we recommend as per usual, baseline history, physical examination, and particularly asking about prior exposure, drug exposure, ILD, uh, and also uh, comorbidities. You know, how's your asthma? Do you have moderate asthma, severe asthma? What about your COPD? So focus on those risk factors we mentioned. Patient education is key, but how can we educate if we don't know ourselves? So educating ourselves and our colleagues is super important. And then educating the patients like we did with COVID, now with, with TDXD, if you're on this agent, make sure you report symptoms of a new or a changing cough, shortness of breath, unexplained fever, report it to us immediately. We recommend an SPO2 assessment with every clinic visit as I outlined before to you. Now you'll do obviously baseline CT scan at the diagnosis and that CT scan to look at your, your breast cancer disease but make sure you have a proper CT chest. We don't recommend that you necessarily have to have a higher resolution, higher resolution CT scan up front. That's what we did with all and continue to do with the Destiny Breast uh, clinical trials. But in real world, as long as you have a proper baseline CT image, that would be enough. In clinical trial, we did CT scans every six weeks, but that's completely impractical, impractical for Canadian practice actually worldwide. Even in the US, they, they just, they can do it. But we do recommend ongoing surveillance at least every nine to 12 weeks. When it is suspected on CT imaging or clinically otherwise, and you have a suspicion on regular CT chest, confirm the diagnosis, with a high resolution CT scan and get your pulmonologist involved. Make sure to look at other etiologies and then you'll do other additional investigations depending on the severity of disease as well as complications which may arise. So before I talk about um, the grading, I want to say that we at this time do not understand and know what the the mechanism is of TDXD-related ILD, why it happens the way it happens. There's been some uh, information published and some um, scientists looking at animal models, actually monkeys, and they saw more microphages um, in the lung interstitium of these monkeys treated with TDXD, which is causing the inflammation. And really, that's as far as we got. We really don't know what the true mechanism of, of, of the lung interstitium involves with DDXD. As far as the grading is concerned, you know, grade one to five with five being death. And, and grade one, the patient is completely asymptomatic and you just see a little bit of fluff on, on imaging. Grade two, the patient will report some symptoms, but it's really not affecting their ADLs. Whereas grade three, the symptoms are severe, becoming, becoming severe, they might be oxygen dependent already and, and self-care with ADLs get to be a problem. And grade four, they are in a life-threatening position. Now, collaboration with your radiologist is key here. And not only key in really helping to define what the grading is, but initially diagnosing, doing, uh, helping you with a diagnosis because you'll submit your requisition for restaging or surveillance or follow-up imaging for your breast cancer. 
but make sure your radiologist knows to check for ILD as well because the patient is on a drug suspected for ILD risk. Why is it important to focus on this? Well, it's really a few things. Um, at this point in time, if a patient would develop a grade two ILD, we recommend permanent discontinuation of TDXD. That is currently the Health Canada label, the FDA label. It's been done on clinical trials and experts across the world agree that at this point in time, we don't know enough to warrant treatment beyond grade two or reassume treatment after grade two toxicity. So grade two, discontinued permanently. So we don't want patients to develop up until grade two. We want to catch them at grade one so that we can treat them optimally. And then if we do see complete recovery and they're doing well, we can resume treatment. And therefore we can resume effective treatment for the breast cancer. And then most importantly, we certainly don't want to miss a grade two that may develop into a grade three and ultimately patient death. So we really have to be very vigilant about this. Again, diligent in monitoring for symptoms, educating ourselves, educating our clinic nurses, our pharmacists, our GPOs, our family physicians. Just last week, I had a call from a family physician in Lethbridge about our mutual patient. And we talk about her patient who's on TDXD and I explain all of this to her. And I just realized that our community does not know what we're doing in the cancer center. And so it's important that they do know and that they are instructed and that we educate ourselves, our colleagues, our patients about what they're on and what can happen. So that when the patient goes into emergency department with a fever and unexplained cough, that they don't chalk it up to COVID-19 alone or suspected COVID, that they do think about this potential drug and initiate steroid treatment ASAP. I talked about the radiologic findings and there are certain specific findings that the radiologist will help and guide you with, but they need to know, they need to be aware they need to know that the patient is on a potential drug. And then, of course, you know, ask our respirology colleagues to help us. Most oncologists can treat grade one effectively and well, and we'll show you the guidelines. But it is really helpful to have respirology for grade two and higher to determine the etiology. And secondly, to also help manage the patient well and appropriately to good and, and complete recovery if it would happen. Again, um, some, some imaging, fact, uh, imaging features are very typical for TDXD. And I have the hypersensitivity pneumonitis uh, as an example for you. Typically, we see four patterns of ILD with TDXD. Diffuse alveolar damage, which is the worst. And if that happens, patients are at higher risk for fatality. Um, it's infrequent. We see DID. We see more commonly the hypersensitivity pneumonitis, as, as shown there with this picture. Then the non specific interstitial pneumonitis is secondly most commonly seen. Um, and so between those two, those are the typical pictures. And lastly, we may, may see the organizing pneumonia or the cough or the boop. Um, they, that can also be seen, but it's less common. So Hypersensitivity pneumonitis and NSIP are your most commonly pictures. And you can see how it's very vague, just a little bit of a fluffy opacification, and that's quite typical. So for grade one, let's talk about the management. Grade one, you will interrupt treatment right away. And you know, now that we've used many oncologic agents and, and seen pneumo, um, pneumonitis with nivolumab, with gefitinib, with whatever, everolimus, you know, at grade one, we may be hesitant to use steroids or not. And in our expert opinion from the adjudication committee, they still said, you know, you can consider using a steroid. Having said that, though, in our practical experience and in our position paper and guidelines coming forward, we will still say consider, but it's highly uh, recommended so that you can resolve the grade one that it does not progress into grade two. But you have to, uh, you have to stop to hold the drug. And then you want to ensure recovery. If recovery takes longer than a month, 
you probably need to dose reduce with one level. If recovery is quick within, within a month, within a couple of weeks, you can resume at the same dosage. Permanently discontinued work at grade two and grade three. So the dosage of steroid at grade one is 0.5 milligrams per kg per day. And again, uh, you will gradually taper until complete improvement. And so typically it's been my experience that they stay on steroids for four to six weeks. I've fortunately not had any patients with grade two toxicity. With grade two, you hold drug, never uh, restart again. And then a higher dose of one milligram per kg of uh, kilogram per day of prednisone or equivalent uh, for at least 14 days. And there too, you want to re-image and you want to ensure CT resolution. Grade two, most medical oncologists can manage this. If you have a patient, with pulmonary comorbidities or other comorbidities, you probably will find it helpful for respirologists to help. If you ever are questioning your etiology of the ILD, make sure you have a specialist to help you out again. Because again, great to remember, you have to stop drug. So if it's maybe of infectious nature and you can prove it with a, with a bronchoscopy and BIL or whatever, it's important because you can resume. Uh, drug and we had such a patient just in hospital a month ago who actually had uh, yeah. PJP um, and it was because of prolonged steroid use so thankfully you know not due to to TDXD uh, grade three and higher patients are in the hospital um, they might be in the ICU and you definitely use a quite a higher bit of steroid doses here at this time pulmonary medicine internal medicine infectious diseases intensivists are co-managing your case. So what about the follow-up? We also recommend uh, following not only clinically, but also per imaging. And we certainly recommend imaging two to four weeks after the event upon resolution. A high resolution, re resolution scan is important you know, for your established diagnosis to ensure resolution and follow-up. Uh, and again, at this point in time, when it gets to be grade two and grade three, your, your pulmonologist will guide you and help you determine, you know, duration of steroid use, the frequency of imaging, et cetera. So everybody has a role to play in managing drug-induced ILD, particularly related to TDXD. For the medical oncologist, I mean, we are forefront here offering and recommending these treatments to our patients to not only breast cancer and a larger group of breast cancer, but this is also now touching into non-small cell lung cancer gastric cancer, colorectal cancer. So the field is expanding. As I told my fellow, you just need to treat long enough and you will run into toxicities. Um, it is just statistically bound to happen. You have to notify the radiologist about the intention of your scan, not only to monitor breast cancer, but also to check for ILD. For the radiologist, um, you know, when you receive that requisition, pay attention to that little asterisk, that little highlight saying patient is on an ILD-induced drug, uh, check for pneumonitis and report. You know, that's the time to kind of pick up the phone and say, hey, thank you for the scan. I've noticed the breast cancer is looking better, but I want to make you aware of A, B, and C. And then for our respirology colleagues, we, we certainly want to work alongside with them, particularly with our patients with pre-existing lung comorbidities, are they well and fit enough? You know, for anybody with moderate to severe disease, TDXD may not be the right agent for that patient. And, and so we need the respirology as much as we use cardiologists in cardio-oncology. Now is the time that we really use our respirologists to say, is this patient fit and well enough to engage in this therapy? And if something would happen, how should we help each other? If a patient is completely de novo for any lung conditions and does develop ILD and it's of higher severity, you know, the help of respirology is definitely needed, not only for the diagnosis and establishing etiology, but also co-management uh, duration of steroid treatment. And in some cases, even um, anti-TNF and other agents. So in summary, uh, this new agent, novel therapy in breast cancer, maybe others, um, is certainly very effective, but there is an increase in ILD pneumonitis. It's important to identify this so that we can diagnose it as an early stage, that we can continue with this highly effective 
medication and can avoid uh, bad outcomes. But a multidisciplinary approach is definitely needed as I've outlined. Proactive monitoring to our patients, ourselves, our colleagues, people out there uh, is definitely warranted. So as a follow-up to this, our ILD steering committee, which is a multidiscipline committee team, has established um, a CME program, um, which will be released in, in the next uh, month or so. And with this too, a consensus position paper, which is essentially the same as a guideline paper, which will be published and also available uh, for the medical community to, uh, to learn and actually reflect upon how it can be uh, practice uh, adopted into practice as a new standard of care and we can safely administer drug and monitor these patients. So with that, there's enough time, 10 minutes or so for, for questions, comments, um, over to you, Dr. Lau, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Henning. That was a, a very informative and, and great talk and highly relevant, of course, uh, here in Scarborough. We, we treat uh, a lot of breast cancer. And, and as you stated, the data is just so overwhelmingly positive in terms of its benefit and not only the HER2 positive, but now HER2 low setting. Um, I, I'm going to open the floor to questions, but I, I wanted to get your thoughts. You know, here in Scarborough Health Network, we have uh, our cardio oncology program, which we have utilized for many years now uh, to, you know, co-follow our patients uh, with uh, who are uh, starting trastuzumab, pertuzumab, et cetera. And, and I wonder if there is sort of a thought to develop a, a sort of similar program um, with respirologists even seeing the patient prior to initiating uh, TDXD and, and whether that would be beneficial for them to just continuing following along on a regular, regular basis. Yeah, very, very relevant um, suggestion, Paul. And, and we talked about this as a steering committee and, and what should be done in the Canadian context. And Yes, the, the word, you know, pulmonary oncology or however you want to call it, did come up many a time. And and I don't think, you know, we want to or we need to be prescriptive to different sites and institutions across Canada. But I think the small steps here are, you know, to establish maybe an index respirologist in your area to be made aware of the current data and what is coming as a tsunami of prescription of this new drug. And the more you prescribe, the more likely you'll see toxicity. And so we need to be ready for this. And is it time to formally establish the pathways and the care pathways for respirology, oncology clinics, et cetera? I think the time is right, absolutely. And I would encourage people across the country to, to start showing these pockets of champions of oncologists using these agents, but with, but with champion respirology colleagues, even radiology. And that's how steering committee is consisting of, consistent of Medong's uh, pulmonology and, and, and radiology. So yes. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna open the floor to questions. Uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, you can chime in. I, I'm, I'm also very interested to hear what the, the respirologists think. I, th I think we have a couple on uh, the talk today, so I'll open the floor. Dr. Henning, uh, it's Andrew Yun speaking. I'm one of the respirologists at uh, Scarborough Health Network. Um, thank you very much for this very informative talk. Um, and I think like you gave a really good presentation, really good, uh, uh, like uh, really good presentation on, and really the driving uh, drive home point is just recognizing how common these pneumotox uh, pneumotoxicity is on these new medications. Um, I think we have a little bit more experience with the PDL1 in in inhibitors, but uh, the TDX, uh, I already forgot the name, um, uh, the combination, but I like being present in 10 to 15% of patients that are getting this treatment, I think that's very, very, that, that's a significant population. Um, so just recognizing it um, in the medical community and the oncology community, I think it's very important. I think for pulmonologists and respirologists too, we're learning as we go along too, because, you know, 
10 years, uh, close to 10 years ago when I trained, you know, we didn't have PDL1 inhibitors. We don't have, we, I, I didn't really have any experience during my training with these uh, checkpoint inhibitors. So I think it's important for us to be, um, to recognize it too. Um, just a couple of uh, uh, comments on, uh, uh, comments on, uh, on the pneumonitis. From the respirologist standpoint, I think the med prednisone, uh, dosage of the prednisone, if it gets up to a milligram to two milligrams per kilogram, that's a very high dose, you know, um, especially two milligrams per kilogram, which I know ASCO has recommended for PDL1 inhibitors. That is a very, very high dose. So from, um, I would really limit it to a milligram per kilogram. And if, and, you know, if the patient is not responding at that point, you know, I think the respirologist should be involved. And I think a hospital admission should be, um, should be uh, uh, considered for alternative therapies to, or additional therapies, including I, uh, potentially even IGIG, um, uh, IVIG uh, in, injections. Um, another point that I want to get across to, to our, uh, to everyone else in the audience is, I think Dr. Henning made a very good point about, you know, making sure our radiologists are aware that we're looking for pneumonitis. And I think in academic centers, that's, uh, 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 you know, we have to do that, but especially in community centers, we really have to ask our radiologists to comment on pneumonitis patterns, because if we don't ask, they're not going to comment. And I don't think, and I don't think all of us are trained to look at uh, CT scans and recognize, you know, uh, recognize, you know, potential pneumonitis. So I think it's very important for our radi uh, for us to ask our radiologist directly, hey, you know, it, concerned about ILD, concerned about pneumonitis, please comment on it. Um, so that, I think that was a very, uh, very helpful, uh, uh, very helpful point that you made there. So, oh, and last but not least, anyone that starts on steroids, please put them on Cetra. Um, as you mentioned, you know, you had, you had a case of, uh, pneumocystis, uh, pneumonia recently. And if anyone is being on more than 20 milligrams of prednisone or equivalent for more than 14 days, they really should be started on SEPTRA double strength Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or single strength tablet, um, uh, once daily every day. So thank you. I, thank you for those comments. I absolutely 100% agree. And, and Dr. Young, we, on our steering committee, we have Michael McInnes um, from U of D Respirology, um, and and we ask him, you know, Mike, do you think that radiology out in the community can diagnose these patterns we see with TDXD? And we went through pages and pages of scans of prior cases um, from from US and elsewhere, and he's he's convinced, yes, they it's a diagnosis that they, they can make as a community non-academic respirator. Uh, uh, radiologist. But as you said, you know, sometimes there's just a little bit of fluff or pacification. Um, and if you don't look for it, you won't necessarily um, see it. And maybe there's a P to report or disease, whatever. Um, this is the case where I, as a medical oncologist, actually open up the scan and look at the images myself, just as a double check. Uh, we rely so heavily on, on accurate reporting, but Admittedly, here I actually go and have a look as well and just look from prior and compare it to the best of my ability. Um, but I do agree with you. Thank you. And Paul, uh, thank, uh, thank, <clears throat> thank you for organizing this. Um, and with respect to pulmonary oncology collaboration, um, as far as I'm concerned, if we're able to get that off the ground, we'll be the first one in Canada. So that shows you what uh, what challenges that we're uh, that we're faced with what what uh, uh, organizing something like that, um, you know even at UHN um, in uh, downtown Toronto they're not able to get uh, get a program like that off the ground. So um, I know Mike and Shane and Jolene have been looking into that um, uh, uh, respirologists and radiologists at UHN, but they haven't been able to. But we can chat later, Paul, if you uh, if you like. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. I think I think you know it, it, there's an opportunity here, and um, uh, you know I I don't know how open you and the respirology group will be, but you know there there could be a thought that you know anyone I'm thinking of starting TDXD on you know just refer 
uh, reflexively to the respirology group. That's sort of what I'm thinking and sort of have an initial assessment, follow along, et cetera. Um, I don't know, Dr. Henning, if there are uh, there have been sort of any absolute contraindications from a pulmonary perspective, like let's say someone has uh, underlying COPD, if there's a certain criteria threshold where we can't, you know, we, we shouldn't uh, start or be advised not to start or patients have underlying ILD already. I don't know if that's been looked into or if you can comment on that as well. Yeah, so as per clinical trial, any patient who's had prior ILD, uh, whether quiescent or active, will not receive IL, uh, will not receive TDXD on clinical trial. They're not enrolled. I wouldn't do it in practice as well. For any patient with moderate to severe COPD and or asthma, any obstructive lung disease, moderate to severe, not enrolled on any of the Destiny breast trials or others. And again, not in my practice, we will not start. I, I do want to mention though that do not worry about patients with lymphogenic carcinomatosis to the lung, even oxygen dependent, nor lung metastases. Those patients actually do well. Um, you can start them on TDXD safely, and we've seen that many a time, many a time on clinical trial, but also in, in real world. The only other thing I didn't mention kind of as an entity, um, at this time, for the diagnosis of ILD, we don't have any screening things we can do to predict the development, meaning uh, I mentioned the SpO2 and, and the drop of 4%, but PFTs are not helpful at this time for an early diagnosis. The US have looked at this extensively. There's the Swain paper on that. Um, ongoing destiny trials are looking at this too, but we don't have the surrogate for ILD for TDXC, you know, whether it's a walk test, or DLCO capacities, there's nothing. We still heavily rely on our CT imaging uh, as for the diagnosis and early detection. Thank you. Do, do any of the other doctors, uh, respirologists, oncologists, medicine doctors have any questions for Dr. Henning? Okay, I'll take silence as a, as a no. Uh, just sort of some housekeeping issues. Um, there is a chat box. If you open it, there was the sign in form, but there's also an evaluation form. Uh, if you guys could fill that out, that would be greatly appreciated. Once again, I would like to thank Dr. Henning for taking the time out to discuss the data and management of pulmonary toxicities with TDXD today and uh, such an informative talk. And uh, we really, really appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Keep your eyes open for a publication soon in the summer on this topic, Canadian Consensus or Position Paper. And then similarly, there will be a CME program, PowerPoint program being circulated for your use. Um, so thank you.